right, grab a Bible and turn it open to Nehemiah chapter 8. And as you're doing that, actually I do have an announcement I almost forgot. Um, this is, has nothing to do with the sermon or anything else. I just I, I meant to get it in the announcements earlier and, and I forgot to tell them. So uh, this upcoming Saturday, February the 5th, there is a, a freedom rally happening on, uh, at the Capitol, uh, the state Capitol. Uh, it's for House Bill 28 or something of that nature. I think it's how, I'm thinking of getting it right, HB 28. But anyways, it's, it's standing up against vax mandates and, uh, and mask mandates around the state. And so if you want to go, we've got a brother. I don't see him here unless I'm just missing him. Kevin at, at, is going. If you guys know Kevin, he usually sits kind of in the back corner. Uh, and so he's going, and, and he's trying to encourage other people to go as well. And I want to encourage you to go. Uh, if you haven't been able to tell, I'm kind of against all those things. So uh, I think going and supporting that would be good. So next Saturday, I think it's at 1 o'clock. Um, you could look it up. I think it's freedomrally.com or something of that nature. If you want the if you want the website address to know more about it, ask me and I'll send you the I'll send you the web address. But it's next Saturday at the Capitol at 1 p.m. If I remember, that's it. That's my announcement. Nehemiah chapter eight. Now let's get to the word. That's the important stuff. Yeah. Nehemiah chapter eight and verse 13 is where you're going to be. So a few years ago, I was in a group, and this group I did not really know. Uh, well, I didn't really know anybody too well, and one guy says to another guy in the group. Uh, he's like, hey, how's the book sales going? And he's kind of like nudging him a little bit. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And, and the guy's like, oh, it's going pretty well. Things are, things are moving up for us. Everything's going really well. And so then somebody else says, and I, I remember the word that they, the way they worded it, because they were like, yeah, how much did scam a lot take from you? Or uh, scam Amazon take from you? They were talking about Amazon. So come to find out, this guy sells books. He makes his living selling used books on Amazon. And all his friends, all these buddies of his, they're all kind of like poking at him for it. Like, you know, kind of making fun of it. You know, how much time do you have to spend into it? How much could he really make doing something like that? And so on. And I just couldn't help but notice when that happened that this guy just, he just backed off. Like he didn't try to defend it. He didn't try to like justify or make it sound better than what, he just backed off. They're poking fun and they're kind of, they're kind of mocking a little bit and he just let it roll right off of it. And so I kind of perked up to that and I, I went to him after when, when the group was dispersed. I, I went up to him and I, I said, hey, uh, what are they talking about? And he said, well, I, I sell books on Amazon. I sell used books. They were talking about like him going to Goodwill and stuff. I'm like, you get books at Goodwill? And he's like, yep. And, and I have to spare you like the, the rest of the conversation just for sake of time. But this guy makes, literally, this guy makes over a million dollars a year selling used books on Amazon. And... And his friends were kind of like poking at him for it, and he just, he just backed off. So I asked him, I said, hey, could you tell me how to, could you show me how to do that? This is like four years ago. So could you show me how to do that? Could you show me how to sell books on Amazon? And, and he said, look, Justin, I, I've been doing this for about 15 years. And he said, once I really knew what I was doing about 10 years ago, I started kind of trying to tell people. He said, I knew some people who were really struggling financially. I knew some people who were really hurting, and I tried to tell them and he said, I would pour it all out. I would lay it all out on the line, show them everything I was doing, tell them exactly where I was going, where I was sourcing my books, everything I was doing, how I was selling them. And he said, they would take all that information. I would spend hours and they would walk away. And he said, you see the result even today. Sometimes people even laugh at me about it. And he's like, I've got nothing to prove. So the answer is no. He tells me, no, I'm not, I'm not willing to teach. He's like, I'm, I'm tired of teaching people and then they don't want to do anything with what I said. So I'm a little persistent. And I said, hey, what if I pay you? I will pay you. To teach me, you got to understand from my perspective, this guy's not offering me anything. He's telling me, no, I'm like, I'll pay you. I'll, I'll give you money. I'll pay you. And he thought about it for a little bit. And he said, I don't need any more money. That's what he said to me. He said, I don't think about that. He goes, I don't need any more money. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'm, he said, my problem is I'm tired of teaching people and they don't listen. He said, so if you'll, um, if you'll listen to what I say, I'll give you one thing at a time. If I tell you one thing, you do that one thing, and I'll give you something else. If you ever don't do the one thing I tell you to do, I won't teach anymore because I'm tired of teaching people, and then they don't want to hear. So whatever I tell you to do, you have to go do it, and then don't come back to me and ask me anything else until, until you've done that one thing. And so over the course of the next 12 months, he taught me how to sell books on Amazon, literally taught me step by step, and I would do one thing, and then I would do the next. I, I get Sometimes you all get on me for not finishing my stories. I Just to finish that story, I don't make a million dollars a year selling books on Amazon. <laughs> I did really well, uh, but then my wife passed away, and that's just an emotional thing for me now. And so I couldn't do it. I gave all my books away, and I, I can't do it anymore. But it was pretty lucrative when I did. And, and this guy showed me how to do it. If a guy making a million dollars a year selling used books that he's getting at Goodwill and, and thrift stores says, here's how I do it, you think you ought to listen to that, right? I mean, you would go, he probably knows how to do it. He knows what he's talking about. 
How many times do we do that probably with other people in our lives? They know what they're doing, they, they've experienced it, and they tell us something, and then we don't listen. We walk away, do nothing. And then I want you to think about God's Word and how often we find exactly what we need in God's Word, but we walk away and we do nothing. I'm going to show you a similar story to that out of Nehemiah. This is what happened, it had happened in the past, and they're trying to rectify that. They're trying to fix that. It's Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 13. Do you have it? Yes. There we go. That's good. <laughs> Y'all learning. <laughs> Nehemiah 8 and 13. Here it is. Now on the second day, the heads of the father's houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of, of the seventh month, and that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches and branches of oil trees and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. And then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in the courtyards or in the court of the house of God or in the open square of the water gate or in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. And so the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. And there was a very great gladness. Also, day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. Let's go to the Lord about his word. Heavenly Father, we ask you to reveal yourself to us. Father, we ask you to fill this place with your Holy Spirit. And we pray that your word would come alive to us. May we see it with fresh eyes. Father, may, may we understand. We are asking you, help us. We do not understand on our own. Father, we pray that you'd fill us with your spirit and that we would understand your word and we would leave here. Just like these people went to Ezra, Father, they wanted to know. We want to know. We want to understand and we ask you that you would lead us to that. Would you lead us to an understanding, and not just that we would have a head knowledge, but, Father, that we would leave this place changed for you. Would you do that in Jesus' name? Amen. All right. Look in verse 13. Now, on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. So this is now the third time that everybody has gathered up. Now, remember the story with me. I'm super brief, right? They, Nehemiah had gone into Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. Everybody just give me a little amen or a head shake. Yeah, you got that. So they were going to rebuild the wall because the wall was all knocked down, the wall of Jerusalem. Nehemiah had went in and he inspired and empowered the regular average Jewish person who was living in Jerusalem to jump in on building the wall. Remember that? He didn't bring in a crew. He didn't bring a construction team. He came in and got the regular average person to get up, get out of their house, go dig through the rubble, find the bricks and put the bricks back and build the wall back up. And then the things that they didn't have, he got it secured from the king and they rebuilt the wall and they put all the gates up. Does anybody remember how long it took? 52 days. 52 days later, they had the entire wall rebuilt. That was a feat of the Lord himself. Remember, even all the other nations were looking around and they were shocked to see that the wall had gone up so quickly. There, at this point, there's no denying that God was the one doing it. And so the regular average person had been doing the work. That's a sermon in itself for you. You ought to decide, you ought to decide what that means for us. That means the same thing for us. The Lord wants us, regular average people, going out and building his kingdom. And then not only that, then the rest of the people, all the other people who saw it, they couldn't deny that God was the one doing the work. And so they gathered up all the people inside of Jerusalem. They gather up all of the people and they took a census. They, did, they made a, a, a red, they had everybody register because they wanted to know who was actually Jewish, who was actually in the line of Israel. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So that's a person. They want to know who's in that lineage, who's in that heritage, who's got that, who's got that name. And that's a lesson for you as well. If you're going to be in the kingdom of God, you first got to be in the family of God. That's the way that's supposed to go. And there's only one way for you. You better listen up. There's only one way for you to be in the family of God, and it's to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And he grafts you. He adopts you into the family of God. 
That's how that works. There's a whole other lesson there. That was the first time they gathered up. They registered everybody. Well, then after they registered everybody, the people gathered themselves up. Do you remember that? Just shake your head. Yes, the guy, this was just last week's sermon. In chapter 8, all the people came together. The Bible said they came together as one man. And they wanted to hear the word of God. And Ezra began to give them the word of God. He began to read. They put up a pedestal. He stood up on the pedestal. He is reading from the books of the law. He's reading from the books of Moses. And the people, it drove them to worship. Do you remember that? It said their heads were, their heads were bowed and their hands were raised. For those of you who are like, this is a Baptist church. Everybody's raising their hands. That's good. That's the way it's supposed to be. The Lord says that all through his word. They were raising their hands, they were bowing their heads, and they were worshiping God. And then as Ezra continued to read and they were understanding, the people started to weep. Do you remember that? And they said, the rulers and the teachers had to say, don't weep. Don't, don't weep. This is a day of celebration. The wall is built. The Lord is in this place. And you might even remember most of all that they said, we, we read at the end of what, where we stopped last week, Ezra and the leaders were telling all the people, don't weep and rejoice because you understand what God has said. And so they, they went away rejoicing and they were gathering up all the people and they were having a feast and they were giving to those who had nothing prepared. They were giving food to each other and they were having this big celebration time. And that's where we ended. And now it's the very next day, one day later. So one day they're, they're Ezra's reading, they're worshiping, they're crying. They're sent away to go celebrate and the people do it again. The next day, verse 13 says, now on the second day, the heads of the father's houses of all the people of the priests and the, and the Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe. And why are they gathered together on the second day? What's it say? In order to understand the words of the law. They wanted it again. They want more. Now I want to say this to you and I want you to grasp onto this. This is exactly what God's people should be doing. If they've, they've got the wall of the city up, now they want to know where the city should go. What should be done next in the city? How should these people be living? How should they be behaving? And where do they turn? They want the law. They want God's word. And so they call for Ezra a second day and they say, give it to us again. We want to hear it. We want to understand more. Explain to us what's inside of this. And I'm telling you, that's exactly how it should be for us as well. God has given us his word, and his word has a direction. This past week, I was working with my daughter, and I was I homeschooled my kids, and so I was working with my youngest daughter, Phoebe. She's in fourth grade, and we were talking about uh, magnetism and electricity. And so, yeah, it was a, so <laughs> some people like magnetism and electricity. It's exciting stuff for some. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so there was a question. She's fourth grade, so just remember, it's a fourth grade question. So there's this question, and it says this. The question is a true or false question, and it said, the, the needle on a compass always points north. And Phoebe kind of scratched her chin, and she said, false? And I said, no, no, it's true. Uh, the needle on a compass always points north. And she goes, I thought a needle on a compass pointed you the direction you were going. And I said, well, I said, Phoebe, think about that for a second. I said, if it's pointing you the way that you're going, then it'll never tell you where to go. It's just telling you what you're, it's like if, if the needle just points with you, you already know which way you're pointed. You, know, you need something to tell you where north is. And so I pulled out my phone and I downloaded a compass on my phone because who has a compass in their house besides you military people? I know, Amy, look, I knew some of you were going to do it. But, but I pulled out my phone and I, and I showed her. And so we're like walking around and we're pointing the compass on my phone and we're, and we're looking and, and she could see that north was, there was always this north. And I said, look, north is always that direction. And so really the question's not where, it's not the needle is pointing you where you're going, it's that the needle is pointing north. Now you have to decide where you're going to go from that needle. If you want to go west, you've got to turn to make that happen. The needle's always going to point you north. Now I want you to hear this. God's word is always going to point you to Christ. Amen. God's word is a revelation of himself. Now what you do with that, where you go, that's on you. The, the needle is there. Listen, if you want to know what the temperature is outside, you're going to look at the, a thermometer. You don't look at a compass. If you want to know where you're going to go, you look at a compass. You get what I'm saying for a second? If you get into God's word, you want to know where he wants you to go. I've read a story. This happens. This weird thing happens. You've probably experienced this. I was talking with my daughter about a compass, and guess what popped up on my phone as a little blog? It was a story from... Ninth, no, this really happened. The story, the story happened, and, and also the way I'm telling it. Like, it happened. It popped up on my phone. I clicked on it. was a little blog post about uh, this guy named something Shackleton from 1914. In 1914, this guy, whatever his first name was, something Shackleton, in 1914, he wanted to set out on an expedition to go across Antarctica. He was, his goal was to take a crew of men. He was going to cross Antarctica, go right across the, the South Pole. Well, they didn't make it. They got into really troubled waters, like 100-foot waves. Their ship is, is wrecked, and they're marooned. They got in a lifeboat. The crew, nobody died. They got in a lifeboat, and they ended up marooned on Easter Island. 
Well, he knew they couldn't survive. It was too cold and they couldn't survive. So Shackleton and five other guys climbed back in the lifeboat and they navigated their way all the way back to the mainland. Not only did they get to the mainland, they were able to secure a boat and they were able to get so 100 foot waves in just a little lifeboat and they were able to get all the way back to the mainland and they only had one tool with them, a compass. Listen, God's word is pointing you right to Christ. The question is, what are you going to do with that? Look at these people. Look what happens. Now stick with me. They, they're hungry for the word. They want to know where to go. So they've got Ezra. They said, Ezra, we want to understand the word. So they've got Ezra. Look in verse 14. I love this. And they found. You see that? They want to know the word. They've got Ezra. And in verse 14, they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths. I'm going to stop there for a minute. From this point forward, I'm going to say tabernacles or tents because people get confused with my little accent and they think I'm saying booze. Okay. <laughs> it's not, it's not the feast of booze. All right. You're not, this is not, it's not a drinking festival. Okay. Booths with a TH, but it just didn't come out of my country accent that way. And it sounds like other, it's somebody else said it sounds like something else. It's none of those things. B-O-O-T-H. That's the, that's the word. <laughs> it is what it is, y'all. So we're going to say what it says in the Old Testament. We're going to say tabernacles. They found out, they get in God's word, and here's what they found out. They're supposed to do this. They're supposed to make a tent and go stay in the tent for a week. Now, I want you to pay attention. Look, um, verse 14. They found it written in the law of Moses, uh, in the law which God had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in tabernacles during the feast of the seventh month. Did you see that? Let's look at that. Let's do that together. Look back in your Bible in Leviticus. Where did God tell them this? Well, we can find it once in Leviticus. And we'll talk about a few others here in a minute. But look at Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 33. Look at Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 33. And we'll read 33 and 34. Leviticus 23 verses 33 and 34. You got it? Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying... Speak to the children of Israel saying, you ready? Read this. The 15th day of the seventh month. What month? You say it. Seven. Of the seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles, of tents, booths. Okay, the feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. What month is it supposed to be in? Seven. Turn in your Bibles back to Nehemiah, but look one chapter prior. We're in chapter eight. Look at the last verse of the last chapter of chapter seven. It's verse 73. So Nehemiah 8 and verse 7, or 7, excuse me, Nehemiah 7 and verse 73. Do you see that? Yep. Read this with me. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, and some of the people, the Nethanim and all of Israel dwelt in their cities. Read this. When the what month? Seven. Seventh month came. So what month are we in? Seven. In the seventh month. Look down at verse 2. It'll, it'll confirm this. So chapter 8 and verse 2. You with me? You're sticking with it? Chapter 8, verse 2. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the what month? Seven. Now, read verse 13 where we started today. Now, on the second day, the second day of what? The, seven. the seventh month. Are you sticking with me? Yeah. The second day of the seventh month. Now, verse 14. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded Moses by the uh, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month month. What month is it? Seven. Are you sticking with me? In the very month that they're supposed to do it. They didn't plan this. They didn't know it was going to be this way. They gathered up because they wanted to hear the law, get everybody together. Ezra, read it. And when Ezra starts reading it, what do they find? This month, on the 15th day of this month, we're supposed to be doing something. If that was church today, you know what that would look like? That's too soon. There's 50,000. Chapter 7 told us there's 50,000 people. There's 42,000 Israelites, and then there's slaves and children on top of that. There's 50,000 Israelites who are inside of Jerusalem right now. Could you imagine a church with 50,000 people, and we got 13 days to plan? You know what we would say? We're, we're going to run out of sticks. 50,000 people, if we're going to go gather in sticks, the, the, the 40,000 person is going to have to go a couple of miles to go get some sticks. What they're supposed to do, they just read this in the law, and what they said is all the whole city were supposed to go gather up sticks, bring them back into the city, and build a tent, and then stay in the tent for the whole feast. Now, I want you to see what they did. I'm telling you, the church today, we wouldn't have done that, would we? Nope, we would have, we would have come up with every, we would have said, we'll do it next seventh month. 
If we would do it at all, we would say, we'll plan for a year. We'll let everybody gather up sticks for a year. I mean, we got people got businesses they got to deal with. There's things that are, there, there are there are real actual things that people have to deal with. We can't just shut the whole city down and go gather up sticks and make tents on top of stuff. Look at what happens in verse 16. Then the people went out and they and brought them. What they bring? All the sticks. They went out and brought them and made themselves booze. Read this. I love this. Each one on the roof of his house or in the courtyard or in the court of the or in the courts of the house of God or in the open square, of the water gate or in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. Do you get this? Do you get the picture? There's tents everywhere in Jerusalem. They went out and they gathered up sticks and they come back and everybody starts building the tents. And they've only got 13 days to get all these tents. 50,000 people got to find a place to stay in a tent and they all did it in that 13 days. Let me tell you a little story. You guys, most of you all are new in here. And so you, you know me and you might, know, you might even know that our youth pastor is Robert. Robert, you may not know how Robert came to us. Our church, we had a youth pastor and he left. We had a church of about 30 people and we had six kids downstairs in the youth group on a good night. That's if somebody brought a friend. We, had, we were paying our prior youth minister, we were paying him a whole $200 a month, $50 a week. We doubled that to try to entice somebody to take the position, and so we offered $100 a week. Big spenders. The church budget for the whole year was only $60,000. I think that year was actually it was probably like $48,000. And so with a $48,000 year budget, we were offering $100 a week for somebody to take the youth ministry position. Nobody in the church was willing. Of our 40 people, 30 people, nobody was willing to, to take the position. We'd ask everybody. A few people were volunteering to help, but they said, we don't want the position indefinitely. So somebody asked me, they said, Justin, call the KBC. That's the Kentucky Baptist Convention. Call the convention and ask them, do they have any applications? Like, how do you find somebody who's, who wants to be a youth pastor? I said, okay. So I called the Kentucky Baptist Convention, and I said, hey, do you guys have anybody that wants to be a youth pastor? How do I get an application? And they said, oh, yeah, do, what, what church is it? And I said, Salt and Light Baptist Church. And they said, oh, how many people attend? 30-ish. <laughs> and she's like, oh. She's very sweet. She's like, oh. And how, uh, how many are in the youth group? Uh, let's go with six. <laughs> let's, 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 I'm going to make this sound even higher. She's like, and what do you pay? And I'm like, 400 a month. Uh, and she got real quiet on the phone and she said, uh, she said, I think maybe you guys, and she ended the phone call with this, by the way. She was like, I think maybe you guys just need to look in house for somebody that might be willing to volunteer for that. So kind of feeling defeated, I get off the phone, I tell everybody at church that, and they were like, okay, well, maybe the seminary. Call the seminary and ask them. Maybe they've got somebody who would want to volunteer. Maybe they need hours or something for their credits. Maybe, maybe we could get somebody to volunteer. So I called the seminary, and the seminary said, call the KBC. <laughs> so I came back to church. I said, they said, call the KBC. And they said, okay, somebody somewhere has got to have a list of applications. I want to see some applications. How do we look at an application? How do we look at a resume? There's got to be something somewhere. And they said, call the KBC back and just say, where, like, where are they? Can we at least look at them? Like, are we barred from looking at any, any resumes because we're a small church? Is that what it is? And so I called the KBC back and, and uh, the Kentucky Baptist Convention, and I asked the lady, very, she was being very nice, and, and I said, you know, where are the applications? Where are the, the resumes? There's got to be something. And she said, Pastor Walker, I'm really, I don't want to be rude. She said, but they, they, the people who come out of school or the people who, who give us their resume, they, they fill out a little questionnaire and they say, you know, what, what their credentials are, what the degrees they have, and they'll say where, they, where they've served, and, and they'll say, like, what they're looking for, and part of that includes their pay. And she said, Pastor Walker, nobody. There's not going to be anybody who's, who's willing to take $100 a week. And I said, can we just let the Lord decide that? That's literally what I said to her. I said, can we just let the Lord decide that? Can we at least look? And she said, Okay. She said, we'll go over it. They had like a little program. So she's asking me questions and she's typing as I'm answering the questions. And I promise you, she goes, hmm, there, there is one. I said, that's what she said. She said, there is one. And so she said, I said, could you send it to me? And she said, yeah. So she sends it to my email and she said, Pastor Walker, it's probably, it's probably a clerical error. You know, he has to put in, you know, what he wants for pay and it says zero and it's, it's probably just a clerical error. He probably just overlooked it. So I called Robert on the phone. I called him and I said, I, I didn't know him and I'm being very apologetic and kind of self-defeating. I'm like, look, you know, I'm not trying to waste your time, but, you know, this, I, told them, I told him the same story and I said, your, your name came up because, you know, we do pay. We, we can pay $100 a week, but um, your, your pay was zero. And this is what Robert said to me. He said, well, he said, I didn't want to miss 
something that the Lord might be doing because I put a dollar amount on it. So I left it at zero so that I could go where God wanted me to go. Hey, wait, wait. That's right. You can clap. But, but it actually gets even better because then I looked a little further and I said, it says here that you're in Lexington. You're like an hour plus away from us. And uh, I was like, I can't imagine anybody would want to drive over an hour to come to a youth group with six kids and get paid $100 a week. And this is the part I want to get to. This is what he said to me on the phone. That day, the very first day I called him, you know what he said to me? Ministry is never convenient. God did not call you to convenience you and make it easier for you. Are you with me on this? Back to the story in Nehemiah. Stick with me. It's the second day of the seventh month, and they find out on that day, hey, in 13 days, we're supposed to all be staying in tents. So they go around the city and start telling everybody, go gather up branches. We're supposed to be staying in tents for a whole week. And the whole city, 50,000 people, gather up branches and sticks, and they put tents all over the whole city, and they shut the city down for an entire week because they wanted to follow what God had said. Now look a little further. I love this next part. I'm going to have you turned apart in your Bible, except for the early service. I had never had anybody ever turn to this page. They're in t- my entire career as a minister, 17 years being in ministry. This is the first time I've ever, besides the early service, ever turned anybody to this page. But you'll, you'll do it here in a second. Verse 17. I'm in Nehemiah 8 and verse 17. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths, made tents. And they sat under the booths. For since the days, are you reading this? For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. Do me a favor. Here's where you're going to turn in your Bible. You want to do something with me? Turn all the way back to the table of contents in the very beginning. No, I promise I'm getting somewhere. Stick with me. Turn there, Robert. (laughs) Go to your table of contents. It'll be better if you have a visual. You need it. You need to see this for yourself. Look at your table of contents. You should see Old and New Testament. You should see Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers. Do you see that? That was an easy page to find. You should have it. If you don't have it, you're not trying. Okay? If you got an app, you can just click where you change the books of the Bible. Now, looking at your table of contents, what we just read is that they've not done this since the days of Joshua. Are you with that? Now, I'm telling you, we're not going to turn to it. The first time that God mentions it, it's, they're reading the, the books of the law, the law of Moses. That's the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Do you see those? Yeah. The first time that God brings up this feast is in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible. And then he repeats it. He tells them in the book of Exodus about this feast when they're going to dwell in tents. Then he tells them again in Leviticus that they need to dwell in tents for a whole week. Then he tells them again in Numbers. Then he tells them again in Deuteronomy. What is the book right after Deuteronomy? What do you see? Joshua. Joshua. What did we just read? They haven't done this since when? Since Joshua. Now, stick with me for a second. How long is it between Exodus and Deuteronomy? How much time elapses? And that's not, I know you feel like you're thinking like that's a hard question. That's not. 40 years. Because remember in Exodus, God had taught, he delivered them out of Egypt (laughs) And then they get the law in the, book of, in the book of Leviticus. And then in Numbers, God tells them to go, into the, to go into the promised land, but the people refuse. And so they have to wonder for how long? 40 years. At the end of that 40 years, they're supposed to go into the promised land. That's what's happening in Deuteronomy. There's a repeating of the law because there was this whole new generation that was going up to go into the promised land. So for 40 years, they were in the, in the wilderness. And then let's give them the entire time of Joshua. Let's assume that the entire time that Joshua is in control, the entire time that he rules, that they're doing this feast. They're, they're making the tents and they're staying in the tents the entire time of Joshua. So Joshua is about 50 years. Joshua has about 50 years where he's the one ruling in Uh, for the people of Israel. Are you sticking with me? 40 years plus 50 years. How many years is that? 90 years. Now stick with me. Look at the rest of the books. Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. I told you this when we started this series. I need you to pay attention. Nehemiah is the last in chronological order. That's the last of the series of events in in the Old Testament. The Old Testament breaks chronological order after Nehemiah. Are you listening to me? You've got Nehemiah is the last of the events, and then you have, that's when God's sending the minor prophets, and the people aren't doing right, and God's been warning them, and finally God goes silent until the New Testament. You say, what are all those other books? Those are all a prequel. That goes back and tells you other parts of the story that we haven't seen before. Nehemiah, now listen, pay attention. From Joshua until Nehemiah. They haven't done it since the days of Joshua. Are you sticking with me? Just shake your head. Okay, that's 900 years. For 90 years, they did it. 
And then when Joshua was gone and the judges take, take, start ruling the people, when the judges are in place, they stop doing it. And they haven't done it for 900 years. That's not the point. Go back to Nehemiah. Read this. Check this out. After 900 years of not doing it, look what happens in verse 17. So the whole assembly who had returned from the captivity, they made the booze and they sat under them. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. But read this. And there was a very great gladness. After 900 years of not doing it, they finally did it. They, did the, they were obedient to what God had told them to do all the way back in Leviticus. And it says that, that the people were very glad. Can I have you turn to one more thing? This will be the last time we turn, I promise. Look back at Leviticus one more time. Look at Leviticus 23, and let's look at the end of that. I don't want to read the whole thing, but as God's given the instruction of how to do the Feast of Tabernacles, we get to the end of that feast, so it's Leviticus 23 and verse 42. Look at this. Leviticus 23, 42. Do you have it? Yep. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths. Read it. So that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Why were they supposed to dwell in the tents for a week? So that they would remember what God had done. That's both a blessing and a warning, by the way. You do get that, right? There's the blessing of God taking care of those people who would even, even in their disobedience, but there's also the warning of you better not be disobedient, Israel. The, listen, everybody pay attention to this. The reason they were supposed to dwell in a booth, the reason they're supposed to dwell in a tent, it's for their benefit. It's for them. Jesus later in the New Testament was being asked about the Sabbath, and you know what Jesus said about the Sabbath? The Sabbath wasn't made for the man. Or the man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for the man. I was preaching through Genesis uh, a couple of years ago, and when we were on the Sabbath day, when the Lord rested on the Sabbath day, I pointed this out to everyone, and I want to I point it out again today. Only a merciful and loving God could come up with the idea to give us a day off. If you look at what men do, if, if it was up to us, we would set up a hierarchy, and we would have some slaves, and we'd make our slaves work all the time, wouldn't we? We wouldn't, we wouldn't care enough to give somebody a day off. Only a loving and merciful God would care enough about us to give us a day off and a day of rest. And he sanctified it and said it's holy and it should always be that way. And Jesus said, look, the man wasn't made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for the man. Are you sticking with me? Hang on, stick with the story for a second. For 900 years, they didn't do it. I'm going to reference that table of contents again. You see that table of contents? You see the books of Ruth and then First and Second Samuel? You know what's happening in First and Second Samuel? There's a guy named David. You've heard of David, right, King David? Yeah. Would you agree with me if I said David was a man after God's own heart? Yes. Would you agree with me that under King David that Israel was being blessed? Would you agree with that? Yes. Now stick with me. Would you also agree that Israel was missing a blessing even under King David when they weren't following the feast that they were supposed to follow? Yeah. Are you catching my drift? It wasn't, it wasn't that God was, it wasn't that God was going to take away that they were Israelite people because they didn't fulfill the feast. But when in Nehemiah, when after 900 years of not doing it, even under David and Solomon, they weren't doing it. When they finally did it, look what happened. When they were finally obedient, there was a great gladness across everybody. Because that's exactly what happens with God's word. I want you to hear this. God did not give you his word. He didn't give you this instruction. He didn't want to make it harder for you. He wasn't trying to make it a, a drudge for you. He wasn't trying to make it so that you couldn't do it. It's the other way around. Everything that God has done, he's done it for your benefit. Because what we find is this. When we get into God's word, it's hard. It's hard to read because we read it and I say, I can't live up to this. Even, even a feast, I mean, goodness, they're just supposed to go camping for a week. Why can't we live up to that? But we don't. That's funny. You can laugh at that. They, they were supposed to camp for a week, but they can't even do that one. If we want to go by God's holy standard, we never measure up. But then we keep going in his word, and what do we find? When we go day by day and we keep reading it, just like these people wanted to hear from Ezra, every day we read a little more and we read a little more. You know what we find? That the fact that you can't measure up is the very reason why God sent his only son, Jesus. Amen. And Jesus took your place and he died for you. Where you couldn't live up and you couldn't measure up, he did. He never sinned. And then he took your place and he died for you. 
And they took him, they buried him in a tomb, but not only did he lay his life down on the cross, and I say that correctly, Jesus said, no man takes my life. I lay it down, and if I lay it down, I'll pick it up. And they buried him in a tomb. And three days later, not only could, did he lay his, down, his life down on the cross, but three days later, death couldn't hold him either, and he got up out of the grave. Amen. And I want you to stick with me. Hang on, stick with this. Death couldn't hold him. The one who conquered death now says to you, as seen in his word, I'll give you eternal life if you believe in me. Can we go all the way back to the beginning for a minute? If a guy who makes a million dollars a year selling old books looks at me and says, hey, I'll show you how to do it, but you got to do it one step at a time. Do you think I ought to listen? So if the one who conquered the grave and death can't hold him, if he says, I'll give you eternal life, do you think you ought to listen? Death can't hold him. So when he looks at you and says, believe in me and I'll give you eternal life, you can trust him because he's promised it in his word. See, friends, the needle is always pointing north. The question is, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to follow after him? Or are you going to think it's taking you whatever way you want? Don't fall into the trap that we've all fall, fell into. That falled, that we've all fell into. Don't fall into the trap that the world has fallen into of thinking we can look at God's word and, and somehow that I'm going to fit that into the life I'm living. Friends, it's the other way around. I read God's word, and when I find something I've missed, I've got to turn and go that direction. And if you've been missing it today, if you've not been paying attention to him, it's all about his son. It always will be. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, and he wants you to put your faith in him. And I'm encouraging you to do that even right now. How about we all stand up and we'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it, and thank you for the mercy and grace that we find there. Thank you that you care enough about us, that you didn't leave us to, to fail in our sin and to waller in our sin, but, Father, that you have offered to save us through your son, Jesus. May our lives look like that. Father, I pray that we would see this for the truth of your word, that we, our works would be a reflection of what you've already done inside of us. And Father, I pray that we would follow you wherever you're calling us. I, Father, I pray that we'd be like, like Jerusalem in this story. Father, I pray that whatever it is, we would do it now. Father, I pray that we'd no longer wait for it to be convenient, but we would see that even salvation, today is the day of salvation. Father, I pray that it would be on all of us. I pray that we would not only be a church full of workers, but Father, I pray that we'd be a church full of workers that act, that we take action and we move. Father, I pray that you would move in this place even now. I pray that if somebody has never followed you as their Savior, I pray that you'd put it on their heart to make that right, even right now. Reveal to them that you've been calling to them this whole time and that they wouldn't wait anymore. It's your invitation, Lord. Do with it whatever you want. We submit to you in Jesus' name. Amen.